Hey everybody, welcome to another review, and this time we're talking about Iron Man number 233 to 250, uh, which is the second half of Michelinie and Layton's second run on Iron Man. Uh, in case you missed it, the first half of their second run is Stark Wars or Armor Wars, which I already reviewed, and I was really down on it. I really didn't like the story. I thought it was pretty bad, ranging to awful. Um, just so much about that story didn't work for me. Um, and I was really bummed that it that it didn't uh, come together as well as I was hoping, considering Armor Wars is, at least to a lot of people, the definitive Iron Man story. Uh, and it just didn't play for me at all. Um, so here we are with, with the second portion of their run, and I'm sad to report that this is also pretty bad. Um, a lot of it is just uh, retread and recycled ideas and just going back to a place uh, of more nostalgia than character progression. And we'll get into as much of this as I can because there's a lot of ground to cover. Um, first thing I want to mention is um, this idea that Tony that Tony Stark is kind of James Bond. Uh, it's been there since Michelin and Layton's first run, and that's the one compliment I can pay this run and um, everything in between, uh, is that Tony continues to be kind of a James Bond character where issues open where uh, he's in the back of like a van and he's got a gun pointed at him uh, and he just handles them really coolly. He's um, every woman in the world loves him and he's just all over the place kind of uh, a, a James Bond archetype. Uh, and it, it fits with the fact that uh, if you trace him back, the, the character archetypes of both James Bond and Batman and Tony Stark, they all go back to that uh, Byronic hero framework. And so it, it's nice to see that that link is a little bit more clear uh, than someone might initially think. Um, here's the problem, though. Uh, Tony's got all of the, at least in this front, Tony's got all of the James Bondian traits of womanizing and gadgets and uh, spying and such, but none of them are redeemable. Um, for instance, the womanizing. Um, the womanizing is a pretty big issue for me, uh, because Tony's always been a guy that's had multiple flings. He's always been a person that's never really been steady with one person until he, unless he's really infatuated with them. Um, but this story treats women pretty poorly. Um, Tony's dating two girls at the exact same time, and they're both okay with it. Uh, Rhodey is dating a girl, and then tells Tony that, well, I don't know how much I like her until I go out with another girl, and then have someone to compare it to. Uh, I get that it's... I mean, okay, I don't even get it. It's the 80s, they're, they're, it, it, when this run takes place. Uh, it just shouldn't read like that. It feels very, very archaic in that way. Uh, if it was a 60s story, I could maybe just see uh, Going With The Times, but... No, it's it's just downright poor in how it handles uh, relationships. Uh, and it's even worse when you get to the fact that Tony's new love interest, her the main one, is basically just a recycled Beth. Uh, Bethany Kate from the first one. She has all the same qualities, all of the same type of dialogue, and works with Tony the exact same way all the way through. And again, just really sad to see how much of this run is just regression. Because um, in the, in the, at the end of this, uh, near the end of this, uh, Tony, one of Tony's girlfriends, the other one, uh, shoots him with a gun and it, uh, the bullet severs his spine and he becomes paralyzed. Uh, in becoming paralyzed, he gets treated very differently. He get the same kind of commentary O'Neill was doing with Tony, um, as a alcoholic and homeless, except this time it's with, uh, paralysis. And, uh, Tony's got a very, uh, very, uh, big chip on his shoulder of he doesn't want people to look at him differently, even though they are most certainly going to. Uh, and he doesn't want to feel like he's uh, changed at all or that uh, he's inadequate now or um, that he doesn't deserve where he's gotten, almost like he's, he loses everything with the ability to walk and he's lost a big sense of self-worth. Self -worth. And uh, his new girlfriend helps him through that. Uh, but again, just in a very typical Bethany Cade kind of way without ever getting the interesting backstory or the paralleling arcs that Bethany Cade got. Um, and so that's not handled partic very particularly well, uh, especially when you get to the end. Uh, when you resolve how Tony gets to walk again, um, basically he learns of a company that's made a experimental chip that, that could be used to 
uh, heal paralysis. And Tony goes to the office and says, hey, I need you to test it out on me. They say, no, it'd be unethical, it'd be dangerous, I'm not willing to do it. Tony says, fine, I'll buy the company. And they said, fine, uh, we'll all quit and we still won't do it. And then he says, okay, well, let me just go find another scientist friend of mine to do it for me. And she just does it for him. Um, it's, it's really really hard to enjoy Tony as a person. It's really hard to redeem a character like that who goes out of his way to just throw money at problems and expect them to be fixed. Uh, you get a lot of a lot of that with that with his lawyer character who uh, wasn't very helpful during Arm Wars because what Tony was asking him was impossible. And he's not very helpful in the beginning of this run either because Tony just keeps berating him for things. And then he fires him and he becomes sort of a bad guy. Um, in every instance, Tony is vindicated because the people he's working with turn out to be bad guys. Uh, or they turn out to be inconsequential, and so Tony's able to just throw money at problems and fix them, and he's become more of Obadiah Stane than he realizes, and I think more of Obadiah Stane than uh, than even the writers realize. So it's just really hard to read Tony and like him as a person. Um, the famous joke is the reason Stanley created Tony Stark is that uh, someone challenged him to make a guy like this likable, and for a long period of time, it's been a success. Uh, this is what the person who challenged Stanley was talking about. This is the, the way you don't do uh, a Tony Stark story. This is where you make the money and the position and the social status completely outweigh anything that's relatable or human about him, uh, and it just doesn't work. Uh, Tony has the same issue of pretending to go through life as solely Iron Man, uh, just because he can't deal with the fact that he's paralyzed. It's ex exactly what they did with Demon in a Bottle. Um, there's this ending arc uh, with Doctor Doom, just like in the first arc, uh, except since that first run was about going, uh, about the past haunting you, they went back in time, and since this arc is supposedly about going forward, uh, they go forward in time, and still just not very well handled. Um, there's plot threads that are thrown in and left and done nothing with, uh, particularly with Blizzard, who Blizzard became a new character during the first half of the run where a younger kid got hired to be Blizzard. Um, and so Tony deals with them here again, except he says that he's been trying to help him and make him go straight. Uh, and they act like they've been doing this for issues and issues, and it just hasn't been the case. Uh, they haven't done anything with Blizzard until they tell you later that, oh, by the way, we were working with Blizzard. Um, and that just doesn't work very well as a payoff. It doesn't work as a redeeming story, and that's something they did in the first arc as well, or the first half of, of their second run with uh, the character of Force. Uh, and that was handled much better because that was actually a journey for that character, and we actually got to know him through uh, certain areas of his life go throughout the Armor Wars. Um, and with Blizzard, we don't get any of that. We just get told that, hey, Blizzard is a uh, novice kid, and now we're supposed to act like he's that all the time instead of actually getting any proof of it instead of actually getting any discussion about it. Uh, Justin Hammer comes back, same kind of recycle plot as last time of he's financing all of Tony's bad guys, and Tony keeps trying to stop him. Nothing new there, nothing interesting there. Um, I don't know, It's it's been tough to read through this batch of issues in particular because there's just not a lot going on. This is 18 issues. Uh, this is 18 issues all dealing with the fallout of Armor Wars, and it's got a very forward, a very uh, clear forward momentum. Uh, it's all building towards an end the way the first run wasn't, but it's all building towards an end that it doesn't deserve, and it's all building towards an end that doesn't really feel uh, like you're with Tony by the end of the story. It doesn't feel like you've ever really been behind Tony. Uh, there's lots of instances where he's just a jerk to people, and sometimes they call him on it, and sometimes they don't, and we're expected to just roll with it. Um, it's it's so difficult to believe that these are the same guys that wrote that first one. These are the same guys that defined Tony Stark and gave us a definitive voice for that character that people were going to use to move forward with. Uh, they'd, they'd regress him so far. Uh, it feels like by the end of the run, all, these, all they accomplished was uh, bringing Tony back to where he was before Dennis O'Neill took over, as opposed to bringing him anywhere near a, a better conclusion or a, a, a better place or a new journey to go on. Uh, this whole run, this whole second run has been about nothing but reversal, and I don't know how many more ways I can say that. Uh, this is not an enjoyable run. There's very little, if anything, of consequence here. The only thing you need to know is that during the Armor Wars, Tony gets a new armor uh, after the Silver Centurion is destroyed by firepower. Uh, that's about it. This is not very good at all. I'm not recommending it at all. Um, you can't find these particular issues in any trade that I know of, uh, but that's okay. 
Uh, if anything, you can just gloss over the Wikipedia entry uh, for Armor Wars and then go on to the John Byrne stuff. Uh, because this whole Michelini and Leighton second run is just not very well handled. Um, uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments, whether you agree or disagree with it. Because uh, I know there are some people that really love the second run. There are some people that uh, vehemently hate the second run. But there's also like a, a very small population of Iron Man comic book fans on the internet. Uh, so it's hard to tell... Um, to get a debate going on that way. Uh, but just let me know what you think, whether you agree or disagree. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.